When I first was recruited to work for Elizabeth, I thought she's from Oklahoma, she's a Harvard Law School professor, and all she does is talk about banking. I was like, you know what? Nobody cares about banking. It turns out that people actually do care about banking. And part of it is because she explained this in a way that people understood it. Why don't we wear a belt with our suspenders? We already have one set no, of regulators. No, actually, right now, we don't have any pants on. When it, I, I mean. it made banking seem cool. My parents were from Depression era, Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. I was the, the last of four children. I have three much older brothers. And by the time I came along, they hadn't recovered from the Depression. And I guess in many ways, they never did. Liz would joke with me all the time. She would accuse me of being involved in the subversive organization called the Democrats. Politically, she was just very conservative. She just thought Oklahoma was going to hell in a handbasket because every Democrat in the world was in charge. She has changed in her political world. If I could have one hour to just go to lunch with her, that would be my question to her. What the hell happened to you, Liz? <laughs> Elizabeth Warren was an academic in the purest sense of the word. Her classes were known as the hardest classes at school, not be necessarily because of the subject, but because of the teacher. She would just be pulling the answers out of students, answers that we didn't know we had. She began a big research project with Jay Westbrook and Teresa Sullivan at University of Texas at Austin Law School. She wasn't you know, super conservative, but she was a moderate conservative, and I was a moderate liberal. And we were talking about this new bankruptcy code that really had barely come into effect at that point. My thrust, what I was going to do, is I was going to expose these people who were taking advantage of the rest of us by hauling off to bankruptcy and discharging debts that they really could repay. And I did the research, and the data just took me to a totally different place. What we found was that bankruptcy is a middle class phenomenon. These people couldn't pay their debts, largely because of loss of job, medical problems of one kind or another, and the house. People had taken on a house that they could no longer afford. Her idea of what sort of the average person's situation was in life really changed. In 1994, Congress passed a law saying they were going to have a, a commission on bankruptcy. It was a hard decision for me because mm -hmm. I really felt like I'm jumping into a different pool. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. losing this uh, this protection of the ivory mm -hmm. tower. Your problem with the credit card companies is usury rates from your position. It's not about the bankruptcy bill. Senator, if you're not going to fix that problem, you can't take away the last shred of protection for I these got families. It. Okay. Uh, you're a very good professor. So there's a transition there from academic to policy wonk to, in some sense, a politician. The credit card companies have been pushing to try to tighten the bankruptcy laws, uh, sort of like locking the doors to the hospitals and then claiming nobody's sick in America. The commission made its recommendations to Congress. There was a very strong dissent, and that led to the introduction of a creditor's bill that was very different from the majority of the commission had recommended. 2005, Republican Congress, both houses, Republican president, and plenty of Democrats voted for it. What's known as the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act passed. Look at the data. There is not abuse happening here. And it just fell into the void. In recent years, too many people have abused the bankruptcy laws. They walked away from debts even when they had the ability to repay them. She was as all of us were, deeply disappointed in the passage of the bill. By the end of that fight, I fully understood that every single Republican stood there for the banks and half of the Democrats did. She was introduced to financial instability at a very young age. About the time I was in middle school, my daddy had a heart attack. It was serious, I thought he was gonna die. He survived, but he couldn't go back to work. They hit some tough times and were falling behind. It seemed they were gonna have to, to move out of their house. And my mother's 50 years old. She'd never worked outside the home. She was truly terrified. While she finally 
just pulled it together, walked to the Sears, and got a minimum wage job. And that minimum wage job saved our house, but more importantly, it saved our family. Anybody who wants to know me has just heard the story. The impact of the trauma of her dad's illness was part of what propelled her to start taking a look at bankruptcies and at the credit card companies and at interest rates. This becomes the basis of her origin story as a politician. Is your money safe? Is your job safe? The worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. The mess that Wall Street made is a mess that Main Street is now feeling. 700 billion taxpayer dollars on the line. All those in favor say aye. aye. One of the things that Congress did in the TARP legislation was say the federal government has to keep tabs on how this money is used. Secretary Geithner, I'd like to recognize you. She would bring government officials before the COP to answer the hard questions about what were they doing with all of our money. Do you know where the money went? Uh, the, absolutely. And the money that... Um... All this help pouring out for the banks in the context of all these people who then were suffering in bankruptcy because of that very collapse, I think she found it very painful. And that led to the Commission for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Sheriff Warren's what we need, yo. Let me bleed, yo. She's not about the money and the green, no. She's about working class families and bringing them out of financial crisis and tragedies. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will be a watchdog for the American consumer. It's a response to the recession, this agency, and she helped Obama create it. This is what she wants. We are extremely proud of you, Elizabeth. Good luck. She created it. She had much to do with staffing it. Indeed, she would have been very happy to be the head of it. Why not make her director, Mr. President? The Republican Senate said forget it. She's the guru, or one of them, dealing with behavioral science, uh, trying to change everything. This is a power grab, a bureaucracy we've never seen. It will not be pro-growth, it will not be pro-jobs, it will not be good for the economy. It was kind of um, set up for her, because it was her idea, but uh, we couldn't get her approved. I am proud to nominate uh, Richard Cordray uh, to this post. Congratulations, Richard. So by not giving this job to Elizabeth Warren, she decided to go back to Massachusetts and run for the Senate. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to run for the United States Senate. By the time she runs, she immediately clears the field. I'm Elizabeth Warren. I'm running for the U.S. Senate. She starts talking about her idea of capitalism, and it becomes this viral moment. You built a factory, and it turned into something terrific or a great idea. God bless. Keep a big hunk of it. But part of the underlying social contract is you take a hunk of that and pay forward for the next kid who comes along. Then it became sort of a very different race. The first day we wrote the story, it was about Harvard University because they had identified her as a minority hire, pointed to her as proof of their diversity. I am very proud of my heritage. Being Native American is part of who our family is. She couldn't quite explain how what she was told as a kid then gets onto official documents. I was listed because I thought I might be invited to um, uh, meetings where I might meet more people who had grown up like I had grown up. There was an evolution to the way that her campaign addressed this story. It's clear that I let Harvard know, that I let Penn know. How? And that it, and that it happened after I was hired. How did you let them know? Was I, it written? Was it told? I don't know. I don't know. When she applied to Penn and Harvard, she checked the box claiming she was a Native American. And, um, you know, clearly she's not. The thing that ends up helping her the most as the campaign goes on was Scott Brown might have overplayed it. And that brought in a racial element that made a lot of people uncomfortable. That's when the tide sort of turned and allowed her to get over it. And despite the odds, you elected the first woman senator to the state of Massachusetts. 
You know, normally the banking committee, it can get hot, but it's sort of a boring committee, right? I mean, she's using her courtroom lawyer skills and her public skills to grill the heck out of these people. Tell me a little bit about the last few times you've taken the biggest financial institutions on Wall Street all the way to a trial. We have not had to do it as a practical matter to achieve our supervisory goals. And here she is creating these viral moments. I'm really concerned that too big to fail has become too big for trial. And they don't know what's going on. At best, you are incompetent. At worst, you are complicit. And either way, you should be fired. The fight that she's probably best known for is when the Senate was debating the nomination of Jeff Sessions for Attorney General. Mr. Sessions has used the awesome power of his office to chill the free exercise of the vote by black citizens. She wanted on the record this letter from Coretta Scott King. The senator is reminded that is a violation of Rule 19. And she had to sit down. She could not finish reading that letter. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. That, that was such a in-your-face <laughs> silencing of two women, of Warren and of Coretta Scott King. That became the motto for women's empowerment after that. Nasty women are tough. Nasty women are smart and nasty women vote. She likes to fight. Trump likes to fight. And so she, you know, starts calling him out on all these things and he starts calling her out and they go at it. Donald Trump is a loud, nasty, thin-skinned fraud who has never risked anything for anyone and who serves no one but himself. She of the great tribal heritage. What tribe is it? Uh, let me think about that one. Meantime, she's based her life on being a minority. Pocahontas. And every time he said something about her or tweeted something about her, her name recognition went through the roof. I stand here today to declare that I am a candidate for President of the United States of America. She doesn't just want to be president. She wants to do things, and she feels very strongly about the things that she wants to do. Our fight is for big structural change. She sees this as her chance to try very hard, as hard as she can, to make a difference, a positive difference. My daddy ended up as a janitor, but his little girl got the chance to be a public school teacher, a college professor, a United States senator, and a candidate for President of the United States.